glorious, glorious. Let me mention one thing uh, about some something that might be helpful for you. I don't know how many of you uh, watch any of the videos uh, from all of our church services. I know some, you know, obviously the people that are watching us right now, they watch us live on Facebook or do, is it anywhere else that we that we appear live, uh, Chris? Is there is it just Facebook? So Facebook is it? Facebook Live is the only place you can like view it while it's happening live. But we are uh, starting on well uh, all the time by Sunday afternoon, usually about five o'clock or so. We get the service loaded into YouTube, and you can watch just the message. It, it's broken out just the message. When I stand up and start sharing the message, that's all, the only thing on that particular video. And then the praise, all the all the songs we do in praise, just one right after another. It doesn't have the offering. It doesn't have the announcements. It doesn't have anything like that. It just starts with the music and does all three or four in a row, back to back to back. And uh, and it, so you can watch it on YouTube, or anybody can. But we started doing something last week that I think I hope will be very helpful, and that is if you're watching the message, it'll have, if you, if you hit the uh, information where it says more and that kind of thing, the whole outline that I give out on Sunday morning will come up underneath the message so you can get the outline. I know for some people who watch online, they don't, they don't get the outlines because they don't walk in here and are given an outline before the service. So they can have that uh, to have it online. So, and we're also going to start naming instead of like Revelation 1, Revelation 2, Revelation 3, we'll start putting a little subtitle as to what that's about. You know, like Revelation 5, 10 reasons why I believe Jesus could come today. So it'll be a little more helpful in trying to find the specific information that you're looking for if, you know, if you'd like to do that. And uh, it's just a tool. It's a tool that we use. You know, we don't make any money off of it or anything. It's not like some big production. But it is a tool in case, you know, you miss something or you like to hear something else and say, what is that all about? And you can kind of go back and watch the things that are there. Just trying to be helpful so we can all stay in the same flow. Because the book of Revelation is really not hard to understand. Look at your neighbor and say, I can do this. <laughs> God means for me to understand this. Yeah, God did not share the book of Revelation in order to be confusing to you to, or to be, you know, for you not to get it, to make it so mystical and so clouded with symbolism that you couldn't understand. The book is the revelation, which means the unveiling, the uncovering, the unmasking of things that haven't been known before, but God wants you to know now. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel and Zechariah and Zephaniah and certainly Daniel, a lot of the Psalms are about certain events that will happen in the last days. And, and, and the Bible is filled with prophetic words and information about the last days. But in all of those former situations, God kept some things covered up. I mean, he told Daniel, seal up the book for the time is not yet. In other words, God didn't want certain things revealed in, in those older days because it wasn't time for them to understand it because it wasn't anywhere near when the people might need that information and it would just be confusing to them and all of that. And so God says, seal up the book. And, and I'll show it someday. Well, the book of Revelation is someday. Look at your neighbor and say, it's someday. It's someday. it's someday. So God says, all right, everything that's been sealed up that I didn't intend for you to know anything about, I'm opening it up now because this generation is going to need to know this information. It's going to be profitable for you to know this. And this is why. Because even though, and I'm teaching this, and I'm teaching you what I believe to be true about every single thing in the book of Revelation. I'm a human being. I don't know everything. Um, I could be wrong, actually. I know that's hard to imagine, but I mean, you know, I could be, I could be wrong. You know, we may stand before the Lord one day and you say, well, pastor said, and I mean, you know, I mean, what difference would that make? Uh, I'm trying to be responsible and lead you properly, obviously, and I'm trying to be responsive to the Word and take everything that God has synthesized in 43 years of ministry and bring it into one and hear the Spirit of God. So I'm trying to be responsible and accountable to the Lord, to what I teach. But I, you know, I could be wrong about some timings and other things like that because some of it, it, it you know, some of it is 
uh, kind of difficult to flow together because of the, the happenings that are all happening simultaneously. It's like, you know, you start painting a picture. How many of you have ever painted a picture, like a, even a little finger paint or anything like that? Yeah, you've done it before. Well, you know how you start with basically an outline of what you're painting, and then you go back and start filling in the different things and the colors and so forth. Well, that, that becomes a picture, but it didn't ha all happen at one time. It started with an outline, and then it started filling in, and the colors and the, all the characters and different little shadings and stuff like that. Well, that's how the book of Revelation is in many ways, because 13 of the 22 chapters are all about a seven-year period of time. There are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, and 13 of those chapters are about one single period of time called the tribulation period that lasts seven years. So 13 chapters, you're going to really be talking about one seven-year period of time and all the different things that begin to happen during that seven-year judgment terrible time on this earth where seals are opened and trumpets are blowing and vials are poured out and they seem to be happening one on top of another on top of another you know it's like a seal's broken and a horn blows and a, and a vial is poured out and it's just it's a lot of activity all happening at one time and it's just tremendous so we're praying for the spirit of god help us to really get this and to know this i believe personally that the church will be gone that we believers in Christ will have been called up. Everybody say the rapture. Yeah, that's the word we use for it, even though it's not in the Bible. The word is not, but the meaning is to be caught up, to be snatched away. That's what the word means. And so we talk about it, the rapture, because Thessalonians says that one of these days the Lord's going to descend in the clouds and, and, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which remain alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Matthew tells us that Jesus comes as a thief in the night. Thessalonians calls it a thief in the night, a woman with birth pains and blah, blah. In other words, a lot of descriptions saying this is going to be really fast and no one's going to know when it's going to happen and then nobody's going to know that it did happen until they look around and see some things missing like a thief would come in and take things. But Jesus is heaven's thief, which is different from an earthly thief. An earthly thief steals things that doesn't belong to him. A heavenly thief steals only that which does belong to him. So the question becomes, do you belong to Christ? When he comes, is he going to take you because you belong to him? Because the Bible says that two will be working in the field and one will be taken and one will be left. Two shall be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one will be left. Why is one taken and one left? Is it because one is a man and one is a woman? Is it because one is rich and one is poor? Is it because one is fat and one is skinny? Well, maybe I shouldn't say fat. That, that's not a politically correct word. Uh, let's say uh, uh, weight challenged. Okay, there, there, there we go. We have, you know, you're, you're, you're a gravity challenged individual. You know, uh, is it because one is uh, uh, very beautiful and one is not very beautiful? No, 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 no. None of those reasons. It is because one belongs to him and one does not belong to him. So the question is, do I belong to Christ? Do I want to be left behind? And he says in Matthew, what are they left behind to? To the greatest time of trouble that this world has ever seen. To a horrible, horrible time that no one would want to go through and endure in life. And that terrible time is what the book, what the majority of the book of Revelation is all about. And saying to you, you do not want to be left behind. You do not want to go through this period of time. And so, I, you know, I, I, of course, obviously, I'm preparing ahead and I've I've been in the fifth chapter this week. You know, we're just beginning chapter four, but I'm in my study and preparation. I'm already like in the fifth and so forth for about the umpteenth time, you know, and through. And, you know, it's funny. And I look at some of the notes I wrote 15 years ago about this and 10 years ago about this. I kind of, you know, obviously keep them in the same place. And I'm looking through and just trying to get an updated word from the Lord. Has anything changed? Do I need to, you know, develop my concept better? Or is there anything that's 
more revealed. And I'm telling you, it is. It is. There's, there's just, I mean, it's unbelievable how the Spirit has opened up uh, concepts and thoughts about things that, that formerly, I mean, I, not, I didn't even really uh, develop or think. And, and I'm just saying to you that, that this is one thing that we need to think about as we look at some of these things. And that is, even though I believe, and, and remember, this is what I believe. And I believe the Bible teaches this. And I believe the Word says this to us in some passages that we will be gone. I'm going to tell you, uh, how can I say this in a polite way? Um, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And we may, and we may actually have to endure some of these things. Uh, you know, I, I don't think so. And I believe the Word teaches us not, that we don't. But, but I'm just saying, look at your neighbor and say, be prepared now. Be prepared. And here's the truth. Even though I think we'll be gone, I don't know how close we're going to get to it before he snatches us. In other words, the events that are described that happened during this terrible seven-year period of time do not just all of a sudden appear overnight. Like one night you go to bed and there's nothing going on and then the next day you wake up, all of this, the, 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 the Antichrist is on the throne. You can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. All of these horrible catastrophes are happening on earth with a, you know, the sun getting dark and the water turning to blood and the pestilence and the famines and the plagues and the, all of that. I mean, that, that doesn't just happen from one day to another. There is a lead up to it. There's a preparation for it. There, there, you know, the time is moving toward that. And at some point along that line, I mean, it could be just 24 hours before basically all hell breaks loose on earth that we're snatched out. So, so we will be seeing it. We will be feeling it. We'll be right on the verge of it. So we're going to have to go through possibly some stuff and, and certainly the lead up to some stuff and things are going to get hard and things are going to get dangerous and things are going to get wacky and messed up and deluded and, and full of, you know, God, take us out of here kind of thing. And I'm just saying to you, listen, the Lord wants us to know how to be ready and only knowing what will happen and seeing it. I guarantee you, I cannot watch the news every day without seeing God's hand of revelation in everything that's happening there. And I'm not, you know, I mean, it's not my job to get up here and be, be a political commentator, and I try to stay away from that because I know we all have different kind of political beliefs, and some are Democrats, and some are Republicans, and some are, you know, independents, and some are I don't cares, and what, whatever it might be. But, uh, and so I'm not up here to spout off politics and, and weigh my weight toward one way or another. I'm just like Elijah, a voice crying in the wilderness saying, you know, here's what God says and wherever the shoe fits, it just has to fit. So I'm not personally trying to insult anyone or insult any, you know, what any of the media or whatever might be happening. It, it just, you know, sometimes you see things and it's just as obvious as it can be that this is part of what's being described here by God in this book. And it just fits right in to exactly what God said the spirit of the age will be as we move toward these cataclysmic events. And so I'm just saying to you, that you need to pay attention. Yeah, yeah. That you need to look at what's happening with an eye of the Spirit of God so that you will not be surprised, so that you will know how to live and prepare yourself, so that you'll be ready for these kind of things because that's why God gave us the book of Revelation so that you could be prepared for these days. Yeah. You'll have a heads up about what's going to happen. And when it starts happening, you won't be filled with fear and anxiety and all of that kind of stuff because God's already told you what to expect, which means you can be comfortable because you know he's in charge. I'm telling you something, and I want you to hear what I'm saying. God places leaders in and takes leaders out. God rises nations up, and God brings nations down. God is in control of what happens in this world. 
Whatever happens in Russia, whatever happens in Iran and Iraq, whatever's going on in the Middle East around Jerusalem, whatever happens with the United States or Canada or Mexico or whatever it might be, God is in ultimate control of everything that is happening on this earth. Do not get sidetracked and look at some leader as, you know, some problem or whatever. God, the heart of the king, according to the Bible, is in the hand of God. And God moves people in and out and up and down to fit his purpose and to fit his direction in life. Now, this does not mean that we don't need to be responsible and pay attention and be good citizens and go out and try to vote for people that we think reflect the values of God and the will of God and the purpose of God. I'm not telling you to just throw your hands up and say, let the wild horses run, you know, and God's in control, so, you know, let's just forget about it and we'll be, you know, we don't have to do our part. No, you need to do your part. Because I don't know about you, but I want to live in the land of the righteous. I want to live in the land of a blessing as long as we possibly can until God steps out on that cloud and calls us home. I would love to be under the leadership of something that's moving toward God instead of moving directly away from God. So I need to be responsible as a citizen, and I'm saying this to you, uh, that you need to go out and you need to exercise your right to vote and your right of influence and all of that. I mean, don't just get complacent and lethargic about everything. Be even more responsible. Be even more dedicated to do what the Spirit of God is leading you in your heart to do and to be in life. I mean, come on, you know, as long as we're in this land, we need to live like we're going to be in it for, you know, thousands of years. I believe that Jesus could come at any moment, but I live my life as if I'm going to be here forever. And I believe that's the life of faith, you know, that that I trust God and whatever God wants to do, that's God's priority, that's his prerogative and great. I'm all for God. I love God. I believe in God. He's got my best interest at heart. But as long as I'm here, I'm going to do everything I can do to be responsible to the privileges and to the, and to the accountability that God holds me accountable to. I'm going to be, try to be the best husband I can be, the best father I can be, the best granddad I can be, the best pastor I can be, the most responsible friend I can be, the greatest citizen of this country has ever had. And uh, that's what I believe God calls all of us to do while we're still here. So... With all that in mind, uh, that's why we're looking at the book of Revelation, especially now. And uh, believe me, it's going to get deeper and deeper, and it's going to be Star Wars City and everything. So get you you something and hang on, all right? I'm going to get through with this outline today, by the way. Look at your neighbor and don't laugh. (laughs) I've been preaching. This is the third time I've preached on this. But I've I've gotten through five, right? Or four. I've gotten through four. Okay, here we go. Let's just look at them. All right. There are 10 reasons why I believe that Jesus could come before we leave this service today. There are 10 reasons that I believe why now the book of Revelation can be real, whereas before many of these things, it could not happen. You say, why couldn't it happen? Because all these things were not in place. If God says, before I come, certain things have to, have to be true, then if those things are not true, it means he can't come because those things he said would be true are not true yet. So I believe that the top, these are the top 10 reasons. The Bible is filled with prophecy about this. It's filled with innuendo about this. Uh, but these are the 10 big things that God exposed in, in Zechariah, Zephaniah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, the book of Psalms, um, book of Revelation, many of the things in the gospel like Matthew 24 and Luke where Jesus is explaining on the Mount of Olives to his disciples what's going to be before he comes and so forth, all of those kind of things. This is kind of the culmination of those 10 things that 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 I believe before we leave this service today, Jesus could come and prophetically everything's prepared for him to come. Here they are, number one, the rise of doubters and skeptics. And I talked to you about that 
uh, the increase of knowledge and travel, you know, uh, people shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased and you've got something in your pocket right now or out in your car or in your purse or whatever that some of you are wearing it on your arm that has all the knowledge in the world. We talked about that, the lukewarm church, the Laodicean church age, which we're part of. We can't change that. We can't do anything about that. Uh, sadly, the, the Laodicean church age is the last church age that is mentioned. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation as the seventh age. We went through all of that. If you don't understand that, if you're going, what in the world is that? Go back, look at the book. You know, we preached it and so forth, but we're in it, and it's not going to change. We can be as responsible as we can be. I can be as challenging as I can be, but I'm not going to change the age of the church here on this earth. All I can do is try to get us to be the most responsible, capable people, even though we're in an age where overall the church is lukewarm. It's not hot and it's not cold. And God said, that makes me sick. You know, I'll spew out of my mouth. And then the fourth thing is the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And that happened May 14th, 1948. So any time before May 14th, 1948, Jesus could not have come because Israel did not exist as a nation. A lot of the prophecy about the coming of Christ and the rise of the tribulation period is all around Israel. It's a tiny little nation of Israel. You may wonder right now, why all the fuss over Israel? All of the Middle East unrest, all of the disturbances in the Middle East, all of this stuff about Putin and Russia and Crimea and the Baltic states, all of this Ukrainian talk that's happening today, all of this Arab issues, you know, around uh, Libya and around uh, uh, the, uh, the area, the Iraq, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, uh, and then in, in Africa, the Sudan and Egypt and blah, all of that kind of stuff and unrest is wrapped up around tiny little Israel. And it always has been, and Israel became a nation May 14th, 1948, for the first time since September 6th, the year 70 AD, when Titus, the Roman general, marched into, into Israel, tore Israel to pieces. There was not one stone left upon another. From that period until May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel did not exist. The Jews were scattered all over the world. The Jews were trying to incorporate themselves into every nation that they were in. They tried to forget about Israel, but God wouldn't let them. God put a love for the land in their heart. God put a passion for go home in their life. And then Theodore Herzl started the Zionist movement and said, come on back, come on back, come on back, come on back. But there still wasn't a land. And then Britain, who owned the land uh, in World War I, right at the end of World War I, declared the Balfour Declaration. Theodore, I mean, uh, I can't remember his first name, but anyway, he was a parliamentarian uh, named Balfour, and he uh, proposed to the parliament that we give Israel something because of their development, their scientific help in World War I concerning dynamite and blasting caps and so forth to help, help the, the allies win the war. And they said, they need a prize. What do you want? And Herzl said, give us a land, give us a homeland. And Israel said, I mean, in Britain said, okay, here's a declaration that you can have this land. Come on home and they started flying in and coming in and the United States had B-52 bombers with the UN flags on them and bringing them back in and they came on boats and ships and the, I mean they just gathered from all over the world and on May 14th, 1948 the Israeli flag went up the flagpole and they sang the national anthem and they established their land once again first time and only time in the, in, in, in the, in the 2000 year history of this modern world that that has ever happened. No other nation ever in the history of this world has lost their land, lost their people, lost their language, lost their culture, lost everything, and has ever regathered themselves to become a nation again. It's a miracle. Well, that happened, and before that happened, uh, there could be none of the fulfillment because as you will see, the book of Revelation and a lot of what happens in this seven-year terrible period of time happens around Israel. And what happens to Israel and the movement of the devil and the Antichrist and the beast and the false prophet, which you'll be introduced to, by the way, and, and this is their movement against tiny little Israel. And so 
Uh, there we go. Now it does exist. Now it can happen. Now there is an Israel to come against. And here's the fifth one. Jerusalem is no longer under Gentile control. Now I put in your notes, and I want to just read this quickly because I, I don't want to get all bogged down. As you can tell, I, man, I love to talk about Israel, and I'd love to talk about Jerusalem and the history and blah, blah, and all that kind of stuff, so I can't get bogged down. Let me, let me just read this. You have it in your notes. Uh, the Six-Day War began on June the 5th, 1967, and ended on June the 10th, 1967. It was more of a miracle than it was a war. Three million Jews up against 105 mil, million Arabs. Everybody say, that ain't fair. Um, three million Jews, 105 million Arabs from, from Syria, from, uh, from, from uh, the Arab worlds, Jord the Jordanians and, uh, and, and Egypt and, and all of the Sudan. And I mean, uh, just, just a whole collection of all those Arab lands that completely surround Israel. And uh, so it was like David against, against Goliath. The armies were, the Arabs were armed to the max with Russian supplied equipment. The Jews totally defeated them in six days. Say, that's a miracle. It was a replay of David and Goliath. The war was not about pal the Palestinian Liberation Organization rights. That's, that's a word you hadn't heard in a while. Is it the PLO? West Bank property or money. It centers in one single thought. Who is going to rule the city of Jerusalem? I'm just telling you that according to what God says, a lot of that conflict that there is not about, it's not about the rights of the Palestinians. It's not about a homeland for whatever. It's not about money. It's not about uh, any of that political stuff that seems to be bantied around and so forth. What it's about is that uh, the Arab states and, and, and even some of the northern confederacy, which Russia is involved in, they want Jerusalem. Why? Because it's the apple of God's eye. The Bible says that. God calls Israel the apple of my eye. Now, I don't know why, you know, uh, Gulfport, Mississippi is not the apple of God's eye. I mean, to me, it makes sense. If you want an apple, God, here we are. <laughs> Look at us as an apple. But that's not the apple. The apple is the city of Jerusalem. And it, you know why it is? Because all the prophecy says that Jesus Christ himself will come and physically sit on a throne that's in Jerusalem and rule this world for a thousand years. Everybody say the millennium. I know that's kind of a complicated little word, but all it means is a thousand years. Millennium means 1,000. And the Bible teaches that for 1,000 years at the end of this terrible period that I'm going to talk to you about and the Revelation is full of, 13 chapters out of the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation is about a seven-year period of time called the Tribulation. Over half the book is about seven years. Detailed information about what's going to happen during those seven years. Well, at the end of that seven years, Jesus is going to fight a battle called the Battle of Armageddon which you've heard about, the blood running as deep as the horse's bridles and all of that, it's not really a war because it's not really a contest. All of the world is going, to do, is going to move against tiny little Israel and they're going to squeeze in from the north and the south and the east and the west. There are going to be million men armies. There are going to be tanks and there's going to be military and there are going to be airplanes. And, going to, and it's like tiny, if you can figure it, figure it, tiny, tiny little Israel a nation that is from here to Wiggins wide and here to Jackson long, that's the whole nation of Israel, tiny little blip on the map and all the world's going to be gathered in and they're going to annihilate tiny little Israel and God's going to step out of heaven and step on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split right down the middle and, and he's going to speak a word. Or, I mean, you know, it's like Jesus is going to say, boo, or, you know, or you say, you know, what's up? You know, what? I don't know what he's going to say, but then all of the, all of the armies are going to be just demolished and, and maybe a nuclear blast go off because it is described, you know, as the earth melting with heat and furious and it pretty much describes people melting away, which happens in nuclear explosions and so forth. But, it, but anyway, whatever way he does it, it's going to be a word out of his mouth and then the blood's going to run as deep as the horse's bridles, the Bible says, and uh, all the enemies are going to be destroyed and Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David. The throne of David is a physical throne, an actual chair that is the throne of David, and it's going to be set up in what the Bible calls Zion. Everybody say Jerusalem. 
And Jesus is going to sit on this throne and rule for a thousand years. Well, if I was the enemy of God, what I would try to do is prevent that from ever happening by not allowing God's people to be in control of the city where the throne is going to be. So you say, what is all this fighting all these years over Israel? It's because there's a fight over whether God's word can be fulfilled by the actual Messiah sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, and he who controls Jerusalem spiritually controls the world. So Jerusalem is no longer under Gentile control is a big deal because now it means that the hands of the city are, the, are in God's hands. They are his people. Look at these words. This is Psalm, this is actually Luke 21, verse 24. This is Jesus talking, and he's, he's answering a question that the disciples have asked him, and look at what he said. And they will, fail, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. That's what happened to Israel after uh, Titus strolled in and destroyed everything. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. Everybody, there are two groups of people on the earth, according to the Bible. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. Everybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile. You are a Gentile. I think you are. <laughs> we don't have any Jews in here, do we? All right. So we're Gent and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So what this means is that the Gentiles are going to control Jerusalem and Israel for a certain season. But at the end of a certain season, the times of the Gentiles is going to come to an end. Everybody say May 14, 1948. The time of the Gentiles were fulfilled. And so he's, here's what Jesus is saying, that it's going to come to an end. Now, in Psalm 102, just to show you that God revealed these things like to David, because this is a Psalm of David, he said, for the Lord shall build up Zion. Everybody say Jerusalem. So he's talking about Jerusalem. He said, and the Lord shall build up Jerusalem. He shall appear in his glory. So all of this time now, since 1948, the things that are happening in Jerusalem have become, become more and more toward God's pattern and standard this past year in December, when President Trump declared the United States recognizes Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel, is a big deal. That's not a small deal. Because up until that time, Tel Aviv has been the place where all of the embassies are. I mean, uh, Tel Aviv is one of the cities of Israel, but it's not Jerusalem. Israel said, our capital is Jerusalem. We said, ah, it's too political for us to do anything about that. We'll just keep our embassy in Tel Aviv. Well, on December of, of 2017, our president said, uh, we're going to stop that cowardice mess. We're going we're to put the, Israel, the, the embassy of the United States in Jerusalem, the capital city, which uh, I don't know, why doesn't Israel have the, have the right to tell us what its capital is? I mean, it's, it, it's its capital, but now we acknowledge that, and because we acknowledge that, now other nations have acknowledged that, and they're building their embassies there, which is the, what it should be. And so because Jerusalem is now becoming ripe, and Jerusalem is becoming more of an uplifted standard, and, and now uh, you know we're acknowledging the fact that Jerusalem is really important, and Canada is, and Mexico is, and a lot of the uh, NATO powers are, and all of that, and Russia's being dragged in because they have to, you know, and all. And anyway, you know, here, here we go, and Jerusalem is becoming more and more exalted, and more and more looked at with reverence, and so forth, and, and, and this is just exactly what what David saw in Psalms, he said, you know, Zion is going to be built up. And as Zion is built up, get ready for the Lord to appear in his glory. Look at this. Here's the sixth reason, the rise of Russia to international prominence. Now, I know this is, you're not surprised by this because anybody that is, uh, has any contemporary uh, interaction nowadays, you hear Russia, 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 it's like Russia never existed before. I mean, we've been, we've, been in, we've been fighting with Russia ever since there's been a Russia. 
Now, let me just ask you something. I mean, seriously, and this is not intended to hurt anybody's feelings, but I'll just ask you something. How many of you are not aware that Russia is our enemy? Is it, would it surprise anybody in here to know that Russia is not our friend? No matter what might be said anywhere, we know Russia hates us and are trying to destroy us and always have been ever since there's been a Rosh or Russia. How many of you are aware that during World War II when Russia allied with us against Hitler and, and, and Germany and, the, and Italy and the Axis powers, that General Patton, one of the great generals of World War II, that led the tank division against uh, uh, Germany and the Blitzkrieg and all that kind of stuff. He didn't trust the Russians and he told MacArthur, we need to go ahead on in there and take over Russia because they're, they're gonna be a problem in the future if we don't do it. And I don't know why MacArthur and uh, what was it, Truman and the president, uh, whether I don't know why they didn't say, yeah, just go in there and take over that, you know, that place. We can't trust those people anyway. But it didn't happen, most likely because of the prophecy of the future that Russia was needed to be there. But Patton advised, let's go in and get them because they're going to be a problem for us one day. Let's get them while we got them, you know. But they said, no, 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 let's not do that. But yeah, who'd, who'd kill what? Oh, I don't even know, brother. Well, ain't that something? I wouldn't be surprised at what kind of intrigue goes on. But the point being that from that point on, they've always been our enemies. Holy Ghost of God. If they're not trying to destroy us, it's malpractice for an enemy, right? If they weren't trying to dabble and do everything negative they could, I would have to accuse them of malpractice. Guess what? We're doing the same thing to them. I'm telling you, if we're not doing everything we can to confuse them and destroy them, we're guilty of malpractice. Yeah. But anyway, the point being that there, are, there is a lot of intrigue around Russia nowadays. Now, I know many people believe that in 1991, are you aware of the event that happened on December the 25th, 1991, when Mikhail Gorbachev resigned as the uh, president of the United Soviet's Republic of, uh, of, of, of Russia, that the USSR com uh, completely quit being a, con a confederacy of states. It would be just like the United States of America. We are united. There are how many states? 50 states. So we're, we're all a bunch of states, and we're grouped together, and we're called the United States of America. But within those states, we have, uh, within that country, we have different states that are all, Mississippi's a state, Alabama's a state, Louisiana's a state, Texas is a whole country, um, California. <laughs> California thinks they're their country. But, but anyway, uh, we're all grouped together for common good. Well, that's the way USSR was. And in 1991, they disbanded and became, and, and became 15 different countries. Russia's just the biggest one in there. Russia is kind of the leader of all of that. But now Russia is its own state. There is no USSR anymore. It's only Russia and Crimea and the Balkans and all these, you know, different states. You hear about the Ukraine and these 15 different states are now all independent. They're not one big country anymore. But Russia still is. And we keep hearing about Russia, 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 Russia. And, you know, we know that Boris Yeltsin was the first president and then he gave way to Putin. Oh, my goodness. Putin, you know. Uh, who doesn't know that he's not to be trusted and so forth? But the point being that, um, that, that Ru Russia is talked about in Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39. It talks about the land that there's a person named Gog, G-O-G. -G. If you read 38 verses, you know, three or four, there's a person called Gog, which seems to be the leader of some land called Magog. And uh, it's the chief prince of Meshach, everybody say Moscow, and Tubal, which is Tubalisk, which is the, basically the uh, uh, ingenuity section of Russia, you know, the, the manufacturing and so forth like that. But the point being that the Bible talks about uh, this, this Russia, this, this land of the north, leading a northern European confederacy that comes against Israel. And the Bible says God puts hooks in their jaws and just drags them down to come on down there and fight against Israel. Well, because we're hearing about it, because it's on the front page, because it seems to be so prevalent nowadays, I'm just telling you, look how Russia has risen in prominence 
in discussion and thoughts in these days. It's unbelievable how it's talked about more and more and more. It's on the front of people's minds. It's in, you know, you, you just almost can't escape it that it's, good night, man, what are the Ruskies doing? What's it, you know, and all of that. It's just unbelievable what's happening. Well, this is one of the signs of the times that Russia will be rising in its prominence, and, 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 and this is one of the things that, that, that the Bible talks about. And let me tell you one other thing. Do not, I mean, make no mistake about it. Every, listen, are you listening to me? Every upset, every evil intention, everything that they can do to keep the Middle East at, at unrest, they are doing it. If you wonder why the Jordanians get flared up every once in a while and why the, uh, why the, uh, uh, the Syrians get all out of whack at times, and you go, what in the world are they thinking? We're going to blow them off the face of the earth if they do that. Why would they do that? It's because uh, Putin's whispering in somebody's ear saying, you, need, you don't need to accept this. You need. I mean, he's dabbling and stirring up strife and moving against and supplying weapons and doing everything he can to cause unrest in the Middle East. I mean, this is the enemy, guys. Don't make any mistake about it and don't underestimate what's going on. And if you dig down to the heart of it, you're going to find the enemy of the world involved in what's going on. To rise against tiny Israel, it's unbelievable. Here's number seven, the rise of intense deception, wars, weather, and natural disasters. Uh, the first line in your note says, don't worry about global warming. And then it says, the media is propagandizing. I, when I read that again, I thought that's really, that kind of gives a little bit of a misconception as, as to what I mean about don't worry about global warming. How many of you are worried about global warming? I, I mean, some call it climate change. In the winter, they call it global warming because, uh, is, you know, they need it for being hot. And in the summer, they call it climate change or vice versa, whatever, whatever meets the need of the times. But I'm just saying don't worry about it because we're not going to be here long enough for whatever, whatever they're projecting to happen. You know, it's going to happen in the next 200 years. Okay, well, I don't think I'm going to be around to say you were right or wrong. But what I'm, I'm just saying to you is that all of the deceptive issues of today, all of the craziness and looniness, all of these bizarre straw men that are pumped up and just uh, intended to make us uh, controllable and apprehensive about the world we live in and the land and the climate and, the, and, the, and, and, and all of that are just inten they're intense deception. I mean, look at it this way, and I'm, I'm serious about, uh, about this point for sure. I mean, look at, you know, Jesus said, I, I think I have it up here. Yeah, this is Jesus talking. Let me read this, and I'm going to just say, make a word. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be. He's just been talking about uh, Jerusalem being destroyed. And they say, when is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? The second question, and what will be the sign of your coming? Third question, and of the end of the age, which those are three different questions. They're not the same question. One of them is about when is the temple going to be destroyed? The second one is what's going to be the sign of your coming? And third, when is the world going to come to an end? And so Jesus starts explaining those three answers. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So there's going to be war, nation against nation, and kingdom against kingdom is civil war, which is within a nation, one part of the nation fighting with the other part of the nation. Uh, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. So what Jesus is saying is, look, here's what's going to be happening the closer you get to my coming. An intense deception is going to begin to take over the world. They're going to, peep, they're going to be religions that come forth uh, that are contrary to me. Uh, many are going to say, I'm the Christ, follow me. And that just has to do with religion. It has to do with uh, the earth being dominated by spiritual thoughts and spiritual uh, lives in, con in contrast to Christianity, which Christianity teaches that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. 
And Muslims say, no, you know, Muhammad had a way. And then the Buddhists say, no, Buddha has a teaching. And the Hindus say, we've got thousands of gods that know the way. And the, and the, and the New Age movement says, it's a better life. And here's the teachings of the New Agers. And you Jehovah Witness. And here's the Mormons with, you know, Joseph Smith and his golden tablet and all that kind of revelation. And all it's talking about is they're going to become contrary religions teaching that there's some other way to heaven besides Jesus Christ. And those religions are going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And Christianity is going to shrink smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as you see the day of the Lord approaching. And I'm just telling you right now, do you know the fastest growing religion in America? Right now, outgrowing Christianity by miles. It's Muslims. Yeah, I don't know how. Explain that to me. I don't know how that's happening and why people would accept that, but it is. And then second is the occult. My goodness. No, second is Mormonism, third is the occult, and fourth is Christianity. Who would have ever thought 50 years ago that all those wacko kind of deals would be accepted and received and Christianity would be booted out the door in America? That fits what he's saying. Many are going to come saying, I'm the Christ. Here's how to go to heaven. And people are going, to go, yeah, I like that. So he said, don't be surprised by this. This is the way it is. And then wars and rumors of wars and all that kind of stuff. There's only been six months. I left it in your notes so you can see it. There's only been a period of six months of total peace in the world since 1900. But the key to this is you're going to begin to see these things with intensity. In other words, they're going to get closer together and rougher and rougher. A woman having a child, the Bible talks about these times are going to come as travail. Everybody say birth pains. As birth pains of a woman. It's just trying to give us a, a thought about how it's going to happen. What is it that's true about birth pains, ladies? <laughs> uh, they start, right? And then they get closer together. As you get closer to the birth, they get tighter and tighter in time. And they get worse and worse in intensity. So that's the key to the thing. Not that there will be earthquakes, because there's always been earthquakes. Not that there will be famines, but there's always been famines. Not that there would not be war on this earth. There's always been war on this earth. But that the intensity of these things will become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and the closeness of their happenings, you know, will get quicker and quicker and quicker. So just pay, your, pay attention to the pace and the volume of these things. That's one of the signs of the coming of the Lord. And so that, that will be happening. And then uh, here's the eighth reason, advanced military equipment and transportation. Um, I, I put this up here. There are many samples of this. We'll see it when I get into the fifth chapter, sixth chapter, seventh chapter, all these chapters that happened during the tribulation. You'll get to see a lot of this imagery. But remember, and, and, and please keep this in your mind, remember when the prophets, somebody like Nahum, Nahum was a prophet. Do, how many of you know the book of Jonah? You remember Jonah? You remember the city of Nineveh and Jonah was called to go preach and prophesy against Nineveh so they could have a revival and he didn't want to do it because he said, I don't want to use my gift that God's given me on the bunch of reprobates and if I go up there and preach, they'll give their heart to the Lord and then I know you, God, you'll be soft on them and you won't kill them and judge them so I'm not wasting my time. That's basically what Jonah said to God and instead of getting on a ship to go to Nineveh, he gets on a ship and sails the opposite direction to, a, to, the, to Tarshish. Now about halfway on the journey, the sea goes crazy and the people on the boat say, "What? God must be mad at somebody. And Jonah said, I'm sorry to tell you guys, but it's me. And so they said, boom, you out of here and kicked him over and then he gets swallowed by a giant fish and he stays there three days and three nights in the heart of this fish and then all of a sudden the fish bleh, belches him up onto the shore of, of, of the city of Nineveh. Now keep in mind, he's been in the whale's gastric juices all this time. His clothes are probably bleached white. His skin is bleached white. He's got a half-chewed piece of seaweed hanging off his nose. And he tromps up out of the water and there's a Ninevite surf fisher out there. And the surf fisher looks at him and the first thing out of Jonah's mouth is, repent. 
Now, what would you do? Well, I know what I'd do. I'd repent, man, I'm telling you. And that must have worked because the whole city repented. There was a tremendous revival, and God did spare the city of Nineveh. Well, a hundred years later, they were back to their old self. And Nahum, the prophet, is the one God sent a hundred years after Jonah's revival to tell tell Nineveh what was going to happen to them. And here's part of what he said. Now, this just shows you how difficult it is for somebody that long ago to talk about what they see happening in this day. Because how would you describe to people what you saw in this day? Remember, there were no microwave ovens. There were no armored tanks shooting fire out of nozzles. There were no missiles. There were no airplanes. There were no uh, vehicles with tail lights flashing and moving fast. And I mean, they just had to try to use images that would convey to people who had no concept of what it was they were seeing. As a matter of fact, they couldn't even understand what they were seeing. If you've never seen a military vehicle, uh, how would you describe one? If you've never seen modern transportation and modern vehicle, how would you describe what you're seeing? You would go, what is that weird thing? It looks like a locust shooting fire out of his nose. I mean, come on, you know. How would you describe an Apache helicopter, you know, shooting missiles? I'm just telling you, this is an example of what, I, what we're talking about. This is Nahum trying to describe some of these things that he saw in the future. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches, like a tank shooting fire out of its, out of its, out of its cannon. The chariots, it looked like a, what is that kind of a chariot is that shooting fire out like a torch? The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. Talking about like military parades and lots of vehicles moving and so forth. Uh, They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. How would you describe taillights in the wind moving at night and you're looking and they're going in all directions and bumping each other and just going all out and and Nahum says, good night, that's the craziest looking chariot I've ever seen, but that's all I can say, God. Must be some chariot with some torch on it and it's just moving like lightning. It's unbelievable. But all of these descriptions of these things, we're in this generation and we see that we know what this means. And the, the very fact that all of this is being seen is part of the fulfillment up until all of this could happen, how could that be fulfilled other than in days where that could be true? Here's the ninth reason, the creation of worldwide satellite broadcast. I'm gonna make this quick. In the book of Revelation, and you're you're gonna meet them in the book of Revelation, there are gonna be two witnesses, the Bible say, that will be preaching the gospel during the tribulation period. These are two prophet people. They're gonna be people that God send to this earth to preach the gospel during the tribulation period. Yes, there will be people saved in the tribulation period. But it, look at your neighbor and say, but it ain't going to be you. Because you're getting a chance right now. You're hearing the gospel right now. The people that will be saved during the tribulation period are people who've never had an opportunity to reject the gospel because they've never heard it. And they're going to be two people, and they're going to come in the spirit of the only two people that have ever left this earth and never died. One of them is the Old Testament prophet Elijah, who went up into heaven in a chariot of fire like a whirlwind. And then old man Enoch, who the Bible said Enoch walked with God and was not. It was like he's just walking down the road one day, and all of a sudden he just wasn't there anymore. Those are the only two people that have ever left the earth without dying. So, you know, in the spirit of Enoch and in the spirit of Elijah, there are going to be two witnesses that, are, that come back in the tribulation and they're going to be horribly killed. They're going to be murdered on the streets of Jerusalem. They're going to probably have their heads cut off. They're going to be made a great display by the Antichrist. This is what happens to people who preach that Jesus is somebody. And I mean, it's going to be an international event. It's going to be like a, a, a you know, a, a, a great uh, 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 antagonist has been destroyed. An irritant has been wiped off the earth. And the Bible says that everybody in the world is going to see it at the same time. 
You know what that means? That means everybody has to have the opportunity to see something happen no matter where it is in the world all at the same time. So before the invention of satellites and broadcasting worldwide, how could everybody in the world see the same event at the same time at the same time it's happening? It can't happen. So there had to be a vehicle by which that could happen before this passage could be fulfilled. Let me just show you what it says. And we'll talk all about it. It's amazing. It's in Revelation 11. Believe me, it's truly amazing. And their dead bodies, the two witnesses, dead bodies, and their, body, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. Everybody say, Jerusalem. So they're going to be killed in the city of Jerusalem out in the middle of the street. And, it, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, Jerusalem. Then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. Oh, my goodness. So before there were satellites, that couldn't happen. Here's the ninth one, the birth, uh, the, the birth of nuclear warfare. Before there was the ability to have weaponry that would do what the Scripture says is going to happen to people, then, then you can't, this can't happen. Oh, that's the tenth one. I just left ninth. Okay, I thought it was the tenth. Just testing, guys. All right, so that's number 10, even though the screen says number nine. But you know, you got it on your notes. All right, so this is the last one. Everybody say, thank the Lord. All right, here is, now, when I watch this, these are just passages I pulled up. This is out of Peter, 2 Peter. This is Paul speaking, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. No, no surprise about that. The Bible tells us all about that. In which the heavens will pass away with great noise. The first, and I put it in your notes, there, there are four, actually four phases. You need to add one more little line at the end of this note, and I'll give it to you. There are actually four phases of a nuclear blast. Number one, it is extremely, it, it'll blow your eardrums out. I mean, it's gigantically, tremendously, the concussion of it will blow you up. If you've ever watched any of the old Defense Department films where they had nuclear tests, the people had to have, you know, the fingers in the ears or earmuffs or whatever because just the sound of that thing would blow your eardrums out. So here's, here's something that's destroyed, and the heavens in, and, and which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The next thing is everybody within the one-mile circumference of the blast is just totally vaporized. I'm talking about all your molecules just explode like nothing left of you, like the wind, pff, and you're gone. And so the Bible says that the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Within the next eight-mile radius of a nuclear explosion, have you ever seen, uh, uh, I see, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Have you seen those guys when they opened up the ark and they just melted? That's what happens in a nuclear blast. Right at the center, the concussion just poof, blows your eardrums out, destroys you one mile away. You're atomized and vaporized eight miles away. You melt right down into the ground. And then here's the fourth thing that happens within a 35-mile radius. Radiation settles on you and for the next 100 years kills everything that comes within a 35-mile radius of a nuclear blast. Welcome to the modern age. Now, just to show you how sharp God is, God gave uh, a prophet, Zechariah, in the Old Testament to me, a perfect description of this nuclear situation. You say, how did Zechariah know about all this? Whisper to your neighbor, God told him. Look at this, what he says. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Now that couldn't happen in Zechariah's day. This is a perfect description of a nuclear blast and what happens to you. 
Look at it. And the people who fought against Jerusalem, their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor. In other words, when this happens, they're going to all look at each other and start fighting each other like this giant confusion has come on them and they don't trust each other and it's just a, a melee and a waylay and all of that kind of stuff because God will confuse his enemies. This is just some, this is what's going to happen in these terrible tribulation days and at the end and all of the events. And I'm just saying because of these 10 reasons, I believe that Jesus could come at any moment. I don't know about you. I just want to ask you, if he did come at any moment, uh, where would you be? What do you trust in? What are you trusting in? I trust in the Lord. But I guarantee you that whatever you trust in, it better be secure and it better be sound because the days are coming that are described by the Word of God and like I said, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. I'm not saying that Jesus... I don't know when it's going to happen. I just know that we need to be ready. And I'm going to ask you where your trust is, where you want it to be. I mean, do you feel comfortable with what God's doing in your life, with your commitment to Him, with your devotion to Him? It's really vital. I mean, I'm your friend. I really want to be. I don't have any... I don't want to manipulate you, control you. I don't have any interest in, you know, trying to dominate somebody or anything. I just want you to be aware of what God says. And just ask you in your own heart right now, where am I? What, what, what do I need to do? I used to be close to the Lord, but I've, I've just kind of moved away. I've become complacent. I've just become indifferent. Uh, and now I, I just have this call to move back to God, or I've never been saved, and I want to trust Christ. Whatever it is in you, let's respond to the Spirit of God. Won't you stand to your feet right now?